Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I'm here with my lovely wife, Lisette Gonzalez, my, my dad, Marino, my sister, Abby, and my kids, Julian and Audrey, in the back, so we can just put our hands together for them. I, everything I do, I do better when my wife's there, when my family's there, and so it's always a blessing for my family to, to be here to support me. Uh, we've been at Cornerstone, my wife and I, uh, she's been there longer than, than I have, but uh, we've been married and I've been ministering there for 14 years uh, in different capacities as, as a youth pastor, as a young adult pastor. Um, my wife and I helped start a church downtown that we pastored for many years, uh, six years. And then now the Lord is just continuing to open up doors for us to share the gospel. I'm with a ministry called Texas Values now, uh, the Church Ambassador Network. And I get to connect with churches and pastors all over the state of Texas and we get to share the gospel and government uh, with leaders at the highest levels. And we go to the Capitol every other year and uh, we're able to bring the word of God to people who are making decisions that impact all of our lives. And so uh, nothing has changed. Sometimes the Lord will just open up doors for me to minister to different people. Uh, I've been sharing the gospel for 14 years and that's just transformed and taken on different shapes and it's just a blessing to share the Word of God because the Word of God has power. Amen? Yeah. And, and I want to encourage you, even as we were worshiping, um, you know, I, I love opportunities to be able to share the Word of God. I need the Word of God. Pastor Mondo needs the Word of God just as much as you need the Word of God. We, we need the Spirit of God just as much as you do. So thank you for having me today because I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. And we all go through our own situations and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We need the word of God. Jesus said the words that I share are spirit and they are life. And I believe that even as we get into the word this morning, that the spirit of God is going to move and that life is going to be given to those who are hungry and thirsty for the word of God. It's not my words. I'm just I'm just a steward of the word. These are God's words, and so I want to encourage you to open up your hearts and to prepare to receive God's word, because it, it's God's word that is going to transform all of our lives. So if you have your Bible, uh, open it to Esther chapter 8, and uh, we're going to be reading out of verses 3 through 8 this morning as I share a message with you entitled, The God of the Turnaround. Everybody say, The God of the Turnaround. How many of you would like to see a turnaround in a certain area of your life? All right. Well, we serve a God of the turnaround. Just when you think nothing can change, God can turn it all around. Just when you think you've hit a dead end, God can turn it all around. Just when you received a report, God can turn it all around. And the truth is we all need a turnaround in different areas of our lives. Some of us need a turnaround in our our marriage or in certain relationships, whether it be relationships in our families or with our friends. Some of us need to turn around in our health. A doctor has given us a diagnosis. Some of us need a, a turnaround in our finances. Something has happened and we're just, just suffering in that area of our lives. God knows exactly what you need a turnaround in. And God is not only willing, God is able. God is able to turn things around. And God knows we need to turn around in this nation. We need to turn around like never before in the nation of America and in the nations of the world. But how does that, that happen? If you need to turn around in any of these areas, I want to encourage you to, to lean in to God's word today. Everybody say lean in. It's, it's one thing to, to just hear the words of God, but it's another thing to lean in. And as you lean in, I want you to say, God, what is it that I need to take away today? Even if it's just one thing, even if it's just one thing that you take home today, if you're taking notes, lean into the word of God. Because I promise you, if you're leaning in and expecting to receive something, God has a blessing for you this morning. Esther chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. It says, now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite, and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. 
So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the king seems right, to, and, and, and if the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to an annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's province. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? The king, Agaserah, said to Queen Esther and Mordecai, the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hands on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name. Everybody say, in the king's name. And seal it with the king's signet ring, ring for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Can I get an amen? I think we know what king we're talking about this morning, and it's not the king in this scripture. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we just thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence, uh, to experience your promises, Lord. Your word says that when two or three of us gather in your name, that you promise to be in our midst, and we just, we just take this moment just to welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We ask you to come and to speak to us that your truth would set us free from the fears and the lies of the enemy. I pray that your truth, Lord, would bring hope once again, Lord, to those who are experiencing situations that they need a godly turnaround in. May you move and speak and have your way in this service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, one of the great privileges we have as a society is the privilege to predict. There are, there are all sorts of predictions that happen uh, every single day. You know, the word predict means to declare or to indicate in advance. In other words, we like to know what's happening before it happens. Does anybody like to know what's happening before it happens? I, I, I like some surprises in one sense, but in the other sense, I just want to know. You know what I mean? Like, don't tell me you have a surprise birthday gift for me. Just surprise me with it because then I'll be itching and guessing what's in that box, what's in that bag. I, I'd rather just kind of know. I'm, I'm, I'm a planner. I'm a thinker. I like to know what's, what's ahead. And, and that's kind of how we, we function as a society because with modern technology, we've learned to predict so much. I mean, on any given day, you can wake up and say, what, what, Siri, what's the weather going to be like? Right. And the weather predict. Now, I don't know how the forecasters in San Antonio have their jobs because they're wrong all the time. But but with modern technology, we've learned to predict so much. We can predict the weather. We can we can predict traffic for you. Houston Astros fans. Right. You can you can predict whether or not a team is going to win based on the percentage of strikeouts and and, and batting averages that they've had. If you've bet money on that game, don't forget to give 10% to House of Prayer, okay? <clears throat> Just sidebar. The Lord will take that from you. All right, we, 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 we even predict the day that children are going to be born. My son actually shares a birthday with my father. And, and, and nine months, or not nine months, probably six months before he was born, the doctor said, yep, he's going to be born July 19th. And I'm like, wow, modern technology. I mean, they can literally pinpoint to a day like not, uh, six months in advance when a baby's going to be born. And guess when my son was born? July 19th, on the exact day that the doctor said he was going to be born. It, 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 it's amazing to me that we've been able to predict so much. The truth is, though, that predictions don't always happen the way we would like them to. Because th there are outcomes that we would like, and then there are things that just happen. Have things ever just happened in your life before? It wasn't a prediction. It wasn't something that you anticipated. It was just something that happened. That flat tire on the way to work, you didn't anticipate that. 
that, oh man, your auto draft payment was declined and your water got shut off, right? You weren't expecting, now you're two months behind on your bill. I mean, there are just things that happen that we, we don't anticipate, we don't predict. There's actually a book called The World's Worst Predictions, and it lists some of history's worst predictions. Listen to this. King George II said in 1773 that the American colonies had little stomach for revolution. Bad prediction. An official of the White Star Line, speaking of the firm's newly built flagship, the Titanic, launched in 1912, declared that the ship was unsinkable. Well, there's been a movie made since then that has proven otherwise. In 1939, the New York Times said the problem of TV was that people had to glue their eyes to a screen and that the average American wouldn't have time to watch television. Now I can't seem to get my kids off the phone. That's all they look at. Bad predictions. As you can see, these predictions didn't play out as some believed. Likewise, your predictions won't always play out as you believe. Things will happen. Jesus said, in this life, you will face trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. There is going to be things that we will all have to walk through. There will be things that we have to face. The question isn't whether we're going to face situations unexpected situations, difficult situations, unpredicted situations. The question is, what are you going to do through it? Because we're all bound to face it at times. And this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what separates us in many senses of what we find in Scripture. That with the believer there is hope because we know who we live for and we know who gives us the victory. So I, I'm not up here saying, look, Christianity is a walk in the park. In fact, it's a fight in the forest. The good news is we have the greatest warrior on our side. We have someone who is mighty enough, who is powerful enough, who loves you enough, who cares for you enough, who, who, who knows the number of hairs that are on your head. I mean, he, he is so infatuated with you. He knows your needs and he's ready to step in. There's a story found in scripture that we've just read, and it speaks of a woman by the name of, of Esther. Esther, like us, faced a situation that she did not predict. She, she didn't want to be in that situation. It, it wasn't pleasant by any stretch of the imagination. Esther was a Jewish girl living in Persia after the Babylonian exile. The Bible tells us that she was an orphan raised by her uncle Mordecai. After the Persian Empire was established, Jews were granted freedom to return to their homeland, Jerusalem. But many Jews stayed behind because Jerusalem was war-torn. Esther and Mordecai were among those Jews who were left behind. They didn't go, get to go back to Jerusalem. They stayed in Persia under exile. I imagine that Esther had hopes that things would play out differently, that she would get to go back to her homeland, perhaps that she would get married, perhaps that she would have children, perhaps that she would start, I don't know, a clothing business, whatever was popular back in that, in that day. But it didn't turn out that way for Esther. And Esther could have done a number of things in the situation that she was in, but we find several lessons through the life of Esther that I think we can apply to all of our lives as believers. Because like Esther, things are going to turn out differently. Like Esther, we're going to be faced with hard realities. And in those mo moments, we have to do something about it. Have you ever experienced a suddenly moment like Esther in your life? Suddenly, you got laid off work. Suddenly, the doctor diagnosed you. Suddenly, your spouse walked out on you. Suddenly, your business tanked. Suddenly, you got in a car wreck. We don't like suddenly moments, but they're going to happen. The key to Esther's turnaround is connected to how 
she responded. So with that in mind, I want to share with you some biblical lessons that we learn from Esther that can help God turn things around in our life. Number one, when we're believing God for a godly turnaround, seeking God is essential. Everybody say, seek God. The first thing that, that will help us to experience a godly turnaround in our life, as simply said as it could be, is to seek God. Now, that's really easy to say. It's really easy to preach. It's really easy to think about. Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I know that the first thing that I'm supposed to do is to seek God. But some things are easier said than done. Depending on the, 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 the situation that you're in, your faith can be tested to a degree that will sometimes put you in a situation where you're not seeking God first. Because the magnitude of it, the severity of it, the, the problem that you're facing seems so overwhelming that you want to turn to other people, that you want to turn to other things. Because the situation has crippled you. It's like being in a boxing match and you got hit for the first time. When you get hit, it's just... It's unexpected. And the first thing that we do, the natural instinct, right, is not to turn to God. The first instinct isn't to fall on our knees and to worship. Even as someone who's been living my life for the Lord most of my life, even as a pastor for going on 15 years, I get hit with things and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And it's challenging even for myself. I, I don't want to project onto you. It's challenging even for myself to just stop and to say, God, I need to seek you in this moment. It's easy to have outbursts and wrath and, and for our emotions to get the best of us. And, and now instead of seeking God first, our lives are spiraling out of control. The danger with quick, quick reactions is that they are hardly in our best interest or the interest of those that we love. How do you react when things suddenly happen in your life? Do you blow up? Do you take it out on your loved ones? Do you complain? Do you make irrational decisions like I do so many times? How you respond to life circumstances will influence how those circumstances will turn out. Esther could have responded in so many ways. When she found out that, 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 that there was a decree to kill all the Jews, she, she could have ran. She, she could have held up signs in protest. But, but the first thing we find Esther doing in this moment is seeking the face of God. If you simply allow your emotions to guide your decisions, you will be left disappointed and stuck. But if you seek God, he will bring you clarity and purpose, even in your most challenging moments. I was talking to Pastor Mondo last week, and he told me that y'all been learning about the Holy Spirit. And as powerful as the Holy Spirit is, right, the Holy Spirit is also a person. It's God, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that messenger, that comforter, that person that God wants us to engage with. So when that suddenly moment happens, you can get on your knees and say, Holy Spirit, help me in the situation that I'm in. Help me in my marriage. Help me in my finances. Help me in my health. I know that there's a number of ways that I can react to this, but but God, I need your guidance. I need your clarity in this moment. And sometimes the best thing that you can do in those suddenly moments is just wait on the Lord. Instead of do immediately do something, just say, God, speak to me, comfort me. Give me the clarity and the direction that I need in this situation that I'm going through. The chances are many of us find ourselves in those moments right now. And God is saying, just give me a moment. Give me your life. Give me the opportunity to speak into the situation that you're facing. And at times, he won't always fix it right away. <laughs> Sometimes he'll just give you a word that you can hang on to that will allow you to persevere instead of give up. 
The Bible says, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. How was he able to endure? It was the joy set before him. It was the word and the promises that the Father had given him that he was able to look to even in the midst of severe persecution. He still had to go through it. But the Father had given him a word that allowed him to endure it. I'm not saying that God is just going to remove you out of every situation that, that you're in. At times, he, he, he will save you. He will deliver you. But at times, you're going to have to walk through things. And the thing that you need to hang on to when you're walking through those things is the word of God or the promises of God is the joy set before you that God is going to come through. Sometimes it's only going to be a word that you hang on to. But God's word is enough. Esther sought God. In Esther 4, 16, it says, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The first thing that Esther did was fast and pray. She said, I'm going to seek God in the midst of this suddenly moment, because if I don't have clarity from God, I can do nothing. If God is not in the midst of this situation, I will fail. And we all have to have that kind of dependency on God. The moment we think we can get through the situation ourselves, we have failed already. Our life is a life dependent on the Father, on the Son, and on the Holy Spirit. Notice Esther didn't go to the king before she fasted and prayed. She went after she fasted and prayed. Imagine if Esther didn't seek God early on. She might have run away from the Jews, causing her to miss out on her such a time as this moment. There would have never been a such a time as this moment if Esther would have responded in the flesh. If she was not living a life surrendered to God, we would not be talking about the same story today. By humbling herself and seeking God, Esther positioned herself for God to work through her life so that she can receive a godly turnaround. Number two, if you want to see a godly turnaround in your life, not only must you seek God, but you must change your attitude. Every wife, look at your husband and say, change your attitude. I'm just kidding. Every wife, look to your husband and say, change your attitude. So my wife and I have been talking about this a lot. You know, our attitude and the way that we think is so important in our walk with God. It's every bit as spiritual as anything that we do. Right? The, the Bible even instructs us to pull down every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of who God is in our lives. We have the ability to exalt or to pull down these high things, these thoughts that we establish in our minds that have the ability to control our lives. Your thoughts, our thoughts control our emotions. Our emotions control our behaviors. But the, the war and the battle, as Joyce Meyer likes to say, is in the mind. Because if your mind is not submitted to the things of God, your emotions will not be surrendered to the things of God. And if your emotions aren't surrendered to the things of God, then you will continue to react like everybody else in the world who doesn't call themselves a believer. And so the mind is the battlefield. And, and, and many, many times we, we lose a battle before we've even engaged because the mind, the things of the mind, the thoughts of the mind are not submitted to the things of God. We find that, that Esther had to have a change of attitude. She had to have a change of heart. She could have moped around in the situation that she was in. She could have come up with excuses. She could have complained. She could have done a number of things. But we find that Esther... Learn to harness the power of her mind and, 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 and having the right kind of attitude. If you have an attitude that says you're less, you are. 
If you have an attitude that says you are defeated, you are. If you have an attitude that says things won't change, they won't. When facing suddenly moments in your life, you need to clothe yourself with the right attitude. Now, in Scripture, we find that our attitude and clothing have a lot of similarities. Do you know that you can, you can clothe yourself with the right attitude? You can also take off the clothes of a bad attitude. Consider these verses that, that compare clothing and attitudes in the Bible. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. It says, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. It says you can literally rid yourself. You, you can literally say, oh, I'm not going to take that to work with me today. I'm not going to bring that into my marriage. I'm not going to bring that into my family. I'm not, I'm not going to bring that into the situation because that is not submitted to God's word. That is not in alignment with, our, with God's word. So we have to understand this, this relationship between our clothing and with, with our attitude because we have the power to choose. We can put it on or we can take it off. And, and that's not going to be God's doing. That's going to be yours. That's going to be mine. We have to choose to put on the right attitude. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Listen to this. Clothe yourself. It's like in the morning, my wife says, stop dressing them. They can, clothe, they can clothe themselves. God tells us what to do, but, but we have to be part of what he's telling us what to do. It says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So in Colossians, we see that we can rid ourselves of bad attitudes and we can clothe ourselves with the right attitudes. Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Ephesians 6, 14 and 17, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So time and time again, we find in scripture that the responsibility to rid ourselves or to clothe ourselves is up to us. You have to choose. I have to choose. Our attitudes are very much connected to our identity. If you know your identity in Christ, it will reflect in your attitude and your actions. And this is why we have to seek God's, God first. Because God reveals who he is and he reveals who we are in him. And so if, you're, if we're not in the word of God, we don't know who we are. So we don't. this is like the closet, if you will. And if we're not going to the closet, we won't know what to grab. We won't know what to put on. We won't know what to clothe ourselves with because we don't know what we have access to. But God's word gives us access to what we can clothe ourselves with, with what Christ has clothed us with. When unexpected situations arise, how will we respond Will we worship and expect God's best or will we worry and expect the worst? Listen to this story. An illustration that I read talking about 
worrying. It says, worry is faith in the negative, trust in the unpleasant, assurance of disaster, and belief in defeat. Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's trouble. Now listen to this. A dense fog that covers a seven city block area 100 feet deep is composed of less than one glass of water divided into 60,000 million drops. Not much is there, but it can cripple an entire city. One cup of water has the ability to fog seven city blocks. This is about one cup of water. If, this, if I had the ability to turn this into fog, I can fog seven blocks of the community behind this. It's small, but it has the potential to fog so much. Sometimes the thoughts that we have in our minds are so small. But if, if we don't take those thoughts captive, they have the ability to fog our entire lives. They have the ability to blind us from the realities that God wants us to walk in. Don't let something so small clutter so much of your life. Go to the word of God and say, I pull down that thought. I rid myself of the things that aren't of God, the thoughts that aren't of God, the emotions that aren't of God, and I clothe myself because I am a child of God and he has promised me the victory. Sometimes we have to have a solid look in the mirror and say, look, I may make mistakes, I may fall short, but I know who I am because the blood of Jesus Christ has covered me and I'm going to get through this situation. The enemy loves to try to convince us that we're something other than what we are not. You may not feel like it, but that doesn't mean you aren't a child of God. Even through your worst day, God loves you. God's pursuing you. God's looking down upon you as a loving father saying, I see what my child is walking through and I want to help them. God wants to turn things around in your life. God wants to turn things around in my life more than I want him to. Always remember that. God wants to turn things around in your life more than you want him to. That's the love of a perfect father. It amazes me that daily he pursues us. That daily he loves us. That daily he's drawing us into a closer relationship with him. What a good God that we serve. That he wants to turn everything around. Consider Esther once more. She believed she was called of God and believed God's favor was on her life. This is seen through her actions. And I, I really want us to lean into this. This is one of those verses that we just need to lean into in Esther chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. It says on the third day, Esther, what did she do? She put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace. Mm. When a decree was sent that all the Jews were going to be killed... This woman of God, Esther, could have done a number of decisions, sought the face of God, which renewed her mind and her attitude to the point that she walked into that closet, that spiritual closet, if you will, and she grabbed her most royal robe and she put it on her and she stood in the court of the king, the most powerful man in the land. Because she knew who was on her side. She clothed herself. She, she stood in the inner court in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. 
Like Esther, when you receive Jesus in your heart, you are clothed in his righteousness. Old things have passed away and behold, all things become new. You are covered with his blood. You become a royal son and daughter in his kingdom and in his family. You have to understand that you are not just anybody. You are somebody. You matter to God and the things that you're walking through matter to him. Never forget you're clothed with his righteousness. You're covered by his blood and nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. Like Esther, you have to know that you're clothed. Isaiah 61 and 10, Isaiah says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed, arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. He has clothed me with his salvation and he has, he has given me a robe of his righteousness. I want everyone to just close your eyes right now. And I want you to imagine Jesus just clothing you with royal robes right now. He has clothed you with a robe of salvation, with robes of righteousness. It doesn't matter how dirty you, you seem you are. It doesn't matter what, what you think you look like under the robes. You have been covered. There's a covering that is over you, that sanctifies you, that perfects you, that makes you whole, that qualifies you for every promise that the Father has given you. Everyone say, Father, thank you for clothing me with your salvation and with your righteousness. If you're thankful for that, put your hands together. Amen. <laughs> Job chapter 29, verse 14, even Job says, I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. If someone can come up on the keys as I close, I have one more point. When faced with challenging moments in life, you need to remind yourself of who you are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. As I've said, his blood covers you. His justice is for you. Where you go, he goes with you to give you victory, to, to give you the triumph that you need in every area of your life. A final way for us to experience a godly turnaround in our lives is to apply God's word. You know, there, there are going to be times in our lives when we need a greater authority to speak on our behalf. And I, I've always used this illustration. I didn't get it from a website. It was just something that I thought up. You know, imagine if you were to just wake up one morning and like a complete stranger was just parked in your driveway. Just like listening to music. Just you're like, hey, dude, like I'm trying to get out the house like you're. You're in my driveway. I need you to move. And he's just like, uh-uh-uh. And you're like, who is this, this lunatic? You say, well, man, if I can't get him to move, let me just go on, you know, go to your neighbor's house. You're like, I got this lunatic is listening to music in my driveway. I got to take the kids to school. I need to go to work. And he's refused. I need your help. I need you to come and to tell me, tell this guy to drive off. So now it's not just your authority. You're grabbing the authority of your neighbor and y'all are knocking on the window. Now there's two, three people, maybe your other neighbors surround the car and, and everyone's like, hey, what, what are you doing in our neighborhood? Get out of here. And it, uh, uh, uh. Say, man, my authority didn't work. My neighbor's authority didn't work. Shoot, I'm calling 911. Boop, 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 boop. You're like, officer so-and-so, I... There's this lunatic in my driveway. I've tried to tell him to move, and, and the neighbors have tried to tell him to move. This guy is just listening to his iTunes playlist in my car, and he went, I need you to get down here to tell this guy to move. Sure enough, whoop, whoop. Officer pulls up. Sheriff. Excuse me, sir. Window goes down. Yes, sir. 
I need you to move your vehicle right now or I'm going to handcuff you and take you down to the county, county jail. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> See, sometimes we have to understand that what we're facing is not only physical, but it's spiritual. And we have to understand that even though God has given us the authority, the, th the authority belongs to him. The word belongs to him. The truth belongs to him. The spirit belongs to him. And, and we have to go with an authority that is not of ourselves because it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. We need to come in the authority of the spirit of the Lord in the word of God so that when we're in those situations, it's not my authority. It's not my friend's authority. It's not my family member's authority. I come in the authority of the King of kings and the Lord of lords in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I need this situation to turn around. Because it's one thing when you want something. It's one thing when you say something. But when you have an authority that speaks on your behalf, the things that you thought wouldn't change have to change. It's like when my son's on the playground and he brought his football and he's playing with his friends and then a complete stranger comes and takes his football. And I can, I can see the, the little fight already starting to break out and hey, give me my ball, give, give me my, that's my ball. Even through the, the eyes of a child, we can learn about authority. Because what is it that Julian does? He comes running to dad and he says, dad, I'm in a situation. <laughs> This kid has stolen my ball and I have said something and my friends have said something, but nothing has changed. But dad, if you come with me, if you speak on my behalf and if I speak on your behalf, I know things will change. Shall I be the first parent? To, hey, better give, give my son his ball back. Oh, Why? Because the enemy recognizes authority. The Bible says that the enemy has been put under his feet. That on the cross, Jesus dismantled all the power and all the authority of the enemy. And so if you're in a spiritual situation, a spiritual battle, you come in the name of Jesus, the name that is higher than any other name, the name that has authority, the name that has power. And you say, in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare this situation is turning around. It may not happen how I want it to happen. It may not happen when I want it to happen. But I declare that Jesus is on my side and everything is going to turn around. This is what Esther did in the presence of the king. After she pleaded her case before the king, the king gave her response in Esther 8.8. 8. The king, as Esther came before her throne, said, now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as it seems best to you. And seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. That means if God says it, it has to happen. So when you find yourself Engage with the Holy Spirit in, in those moments of prayer and, and in your word. And God speaks something to your spirit. Release what he speaks to you. Because if he said it and if he decreed it, there's nothing in heaven and, 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 and on earth that can stop the word of God from being fulfilled in your life. If you hear it from God, speak it into your reality. If you've heard it in his word, speak it into your reality. Because there is nothing that God says that will return void. It'll accomplish the very thing that it was sent forth to accomplish.
One time my dad, my dad used to have little Bible studies with us when we were a kid, and he would ask us questions. I call them challenge questions, like just to kind of see where we were at in our understanding of the Word of God. And my dad said, son, Linnell, Solomon, he said, son, what is, I was reading the scripture this morning, and God revealed at least one thing to me that God never sees. And he goes, you know, what is it that God doesn't see? And I remember being in the living room with my, my siblings, and I'm like, you know, I don't know how old I was, like seven or eight. I'm like, I don't know. I didn't go to Bible college, Dad. He's like, come on, think about it. What is it that God doesn't see? I'm like, Dad, God, you know, God sees everything, right? He knows everything. And my dad says, no, there's at least one thing in Scripture that we find that God never sees, son. He never sees his, his word return to him empty. God's not in heaven waiting for angels to come back to him and to say, hey, that thing you said never happened. He expects his word to come back fulfilled. We have to expect for his word to come back fulfilled. When we speak it, when you pray over your kids, when you pray over that situation and what you're saying lines up with the word of God, that should be the most joy filled day of your life. It may not happen that day, but you can say, I know God's word doesn't return void and I'm going to keep speaking God's word until it happens. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet this morning. I just want to invite you just to bow your heads and in this moment, just, just so you aren't distracted, doesn't make us more spiritual or holy to close our eyes. If your eyes are open, that's okay. But I do find that it limits the distractions. And you know, like Esther, we're all going to find ourselves in moments where these unexpected situations happen in our lives. We, we all find ourselves in different places this morning. And it doesn't matter what situation you're in, we all need God's help. And some of us seem to be in situations that, 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 at least in our terms, we can say are less severe. Some of us may be in more severe situations. Some of you may be battling severe illnesses in your body, whether it be cancer or leukemia or something to that effect. It doesn't matter. God, God is not concerned about how small or big it is. He's concerned about you. And he knows the thoughts that you have. He knows how things keep us up at night. He knows the things that you think about when you're driving to the grocery store or when you're all alone and, and, and you're in the theater of your mind. He knows all those thoughts, all those fears, all those questions, all those concerns. And this morning he's saying, I'm here. And I want you to lay it at my feet. Cast all your burdens on me for I care for you. And take, take my burden. It's a good burden. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. But our burdens are heavy and at times overwhelm us to the point where we're just trying to make it through the day. God has called us to be more than conquerors, not just conquerors, but more than conquerors. Why? Because he loves us. He gave himself for us. He has given us the victory. We have a eternal inheritance. We have promises that he has given us that are right at the tip of our mouths. And if we release them, we can experience breakthrough. So I want everyone just to think about the situations that you're in. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. In Jesus' name, you know the situation that I'm in, and you know the things that I'm facing. And Father, I'm asking you to give me peace that surpasses all understanding, to give me joy unspeakable and full of glory, because I don't live like the world. I live covered by your blood. I live covered in your righteousness. I am a son and I am a daughter so I can come to you and ask for your help in every area of my life. 
So I come to you this morning and I'm asking you to help me. And I want you to tell him right now what area of your life you need his help in. God, I'm asking you to help me in my relationship with you, Father. God, I've been, I've been struggling, Father. There's, there's times where I seem to just be, be, be taking so many steps back and I'm exhausted. I need your grace and your mercy. I need your, your joy to be my strength today. To know that Christianity is not about perfection. It's about my direction today. And I choose to follow you again, Lord. Take this, this weight of guilt and shame that's on me, Father. Father, help me in my relationships, Father. Help me with my marriage. Help me with my family members. Those relationships that need to be restored, Father. Help things to turn around, Father. Bring healing and renewal in Jesus' name, Father. There's so many things being talked about right now. God knows. God knows. Father, help us not to respond according to the flesh, but to walk according to your word. For your truth is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Your spirit is that still small voice behind us saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Give us direction, Father. Give us wisdom where we lack it, Father. Your word says that the fear of the Lord is a beginning of wisdom, and that if we ask you for wisdom, that you would grant it to us, Father. So many of us need your wisdom, because apart from your wisdom, we don't know what to do in these situations. We feel crippled, we feel hurt, we feel lost, we feel weak. But we recognize this morning, Father, that we need you. Holy Spirit, we call upon you. Refresh us. Renew us. Every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of who you are, we pull it down in Jesus' name. Every fearful thought. Every worrying thought. Every shameful thought. Renew our thoughts with your word, with your truth that sets us free, Father. Everybody say, Father, thank you for your peace. Thank you for your joy. Thank you that you are moving even now. Come on, like you believe it. Even now. It may not all happen when I want it to. But I know that you are moving in my midst. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says, Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, House of Prayer.